I had an opportunity this week to do some boondocking in the woods of northern Michigan while helping out with a good cause. So that's a big win for everybody. I am here camped along the Black River and it is part of the Sturgeons for Tomorrow effort where they are just in the area to make sure that poachers are not trying to take sturgeon from the Black River. Uh, the sturgeon have returned to the river after 15 to 25 years to spawn and make more sturgeon. And so we're doing what we can to make sure that they have uh, as much peace and quiet as they need to do what they need to do to keep the species healthy and thriving. And at the same time, a lot of us get to enjoy some quiet time in the woods Okay, my name is Sharon Church and I'm with Sturgeon for Tomorrow out of the Black Lake. Uh, this is the Black River. Our object is to get sturgeon raised so we've got enough sturgeon so the fishermen can get their fish, but also protect these poor things as they're trying to spawn and have more fish. Is there a concern? I mean, these fish have been around for millions of years. Is there a concern about them now in particular? Uh, yes. The, the, years ago, the fish went, the population went low. And so we started having people coming out here and poaching them while they're spawning. And if you lose a female that's maybe 50 years old, you're losing another 50, 60 years of them coming upstream to spawn. So you're losing millions and millions of fish. And so we're here. Uh, the poaching has dropped down. Uh, we've got the researchers in the river that, you know, play with the fish in the morning. And it's, 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 it's coming across. We even had three of our own hatchery fish come up this year, which is a blessing. We're really excited. It's also an opportunity for researchers from universities, from the Department of Natural Resources, and from local Native American tribes to study what's going on with these fish, tag them, keep track of them, make sure that they are doing well, and doing what we can to make sure that they continue to thrive in Michigan for millions of years. Sturgeon live a very long time, sometimes up to 150 years. It takes a long time for them to develop in terms of sexual maturity and being able to spawn. One of the researchers told me that it takes about four years before they can even tell if a fish is a male or a female. And then males are ready to breed when they're about 15 years old, but it takes the females until they are about 25 years old. And that's when they'll return to a river like the Black River to spawn. Lake sturgeon have lived in this area for, I believe, 64 or 65 million years. They are known as Michigan's dinosaur fish. They were here long before we were, and I assume they will be here long after we are gone. It is incredible to see these creatures and to see how large they can get and to sort of watch the life cycle happening here along the Black River has been a really great treat. <sighs> Hold on just a second. <laughs> All right, what was that? A lot of fish down there. Like eight. Yeah. Oh. We handled them all, yeah. We just caught this guy to collect milk. Okay. So, so what's your name? What? Who are you? Oh, hi guys, I'm Doug. <laughs> I'm from Michigan State. Yeah. I'm Mike. Mike, I work with Chris at Drivers. Hey, baby. Just a second. <laughs> I guess <laughs> the stay there, I'll bring it over is easier said than done, huh? <laughs> so this is a uh, male lake sturgeon. He was the 145th, 145th fish we caught this year. We just caught him again because we look at their, their milk to see if it's good quality for fertilization, so we want to check them out again. So I'm going to hold them up for you guys, all right? Uh -huh. oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh that is a small-ish male lake sturgeon. Small. Yeah. It's big. Look at the mouth. That's you so should see weird. the female in there. Yeah. Is this a female? This is a boy. So let me put the girls here. are bigger. The girls, the girls are, are bigger. bigger. Yep. Wait, do you have one? We're, we don't pull the girls out a second time because it's really hard on them. So once we catch them, we leave them alone. So this guy's got two tags on him. These are called Floyd tags. And these are so that when we're in the river diving, we don't catch the same fish again. Oh. So we know because these are here that we've already caught this fish. And actually this guy, we've caught him twice. So we know we don't need to catch him again. What kind of information do you get out of these guys? That's a good question, Chris. So this is a male lake sturgeon. He has a tag right here. How many of you have dogs? 
Your dog's microchip? Nope. You ever heard that before? No. A microchip not. is just a tag that has 16 numbers on it. And we put it in their back so that when we can sc we scan them, we know who each individual fish is. So this guy has his, his like own unique 16-digit tag. He's also got a tag in his fin. So this is his pectoral fin. Oh. So he's got a tag right in this fin. And we use that because it's a bigger tag. And when they swim over our antennas, then we can actually tell if they're in the river without having to catch them. So he's got a pit tag. He's got an RFID tag. And then he's got Floyd tags. We also take a small scissor clip on his dorsal fin. And that way we can figure out, we can look at his DNA and we can individually figure out which uh, snips of DNA this guy has or what his genotype is. We take weight, so we'll weigh them in the net. We also get their length. And then we try to collect if they've got any gametes that we can take back to the hatchery to make sturgeon babies with. Else Maybe. Them? Well, he's not gonna let me show you, but these guys got little vacuum cleaner mouths. You've seen your fish eat, right? Oh yeah, I saw them. I yeah. saw that. These guys are what we call benthivorous, and what that means is that they eat off the bottom. So there you go. So he can Ew. skim the bottom with that giant, giant subterminal Ew. mouth. Pretty cool, huh? It's okay. kind of disgusting. Well, but... we've got to head back down river, so I'm gonna let this guy's guy go. I need. Oh, sorry, Mike. Can we go get our? Get out of here. Can I go get my phone? Can we go get? And back to the river. Don't you do it. All right. I am Brett Bontrager. I work for Seeds After School at Rapid City Elementary. And what were the kids doing here today? Uh, the kids were releasing their sturgeon that they've kept in a tank in one of their science classrooms. They've raised it for a couple months now and it was time to let it go this spring. Is this the first time they've done something like this? This is the first time we've done it, yeah. It sounded like a good experience for them. It was a great experience for them, yeah. So they took part in measuring and weighing the fish. Um, they would feed the fish. They learned cultural um, lessons about the Adawa Indians. And they learned a little bit about water quality with the testing of the water in the tank and such. So my name's Chris Dye. I'm the hatchery manager for Little Traverse Bay Bands of Adawa Indians. Um, we're here with uh, Rapid City to do their Nemei release. I believe we have three or four schools in our Nemei program um, where everybody gets to raise a fish. Uh, they go through like a, a cultural lesson plan that includes not only biology, but you know, social studies stuff and uh, cultural components. Um, they'll bring their fish down here and, and let them go in a nice little ceremony. So who wants to be, we'll go with you. Okay, so when I'm done, I'm gonna go around and I'm gonna hand this out. And we're gonna take it with our left hand. Why your left hand? You guys know why? So your left hand is closer to your heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why we do it with that. When you take a pinch, and it's just a little pinch, it doesn't have to be much. This is all about uh, sending your good thoughts with them. So when I'm done going around and you take your pinch, I want you to look at your fish. Think of all the good things you wanna send with him. And when our buddy here goes around, he'll collect it for everybody. Okay, we'll put him in the bucket. We'll walk him down to the river. And I'd like you to put the all those good thoughts in the river with the fish, okay? okay? Important to start with the kids and get yeah, them learning yeah. about this. Yeah, I think it's great to start with uh, everybody at a younger age. I, I feel that it establishes a better uh, connection with the fish. Uh, they definitely get a lot out of it, I think whether it's the attachment to the, the fish and, and getting some perspective on, you know, they're going to be 30 years old when this fish comes back. <laughs> so. Well, and you did a ceremony before you released the, uh, yeah, the fish to a wonder, yeah. Native American ceremony. And... A little bit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's kind of, you said they have the social studies component too. So they're learning about. Yeah. So they learn all about the biology of the sturgeon, um, where they've, where they've gone, uh, gone away. Then uh, the importance to the Adawa people of, uh, why sturgeon are so important, you know, being a clan species. Uh, they also cover the language in each lesson plan. Um, so obviously some chemistry, some math, stuff like that. Sturgeon have lived a long time, a long history, much like the Adawa. That's, yep. There's a long, there's a long time connection there. Yep. Yep. Right. So the sturgeon have been around for at least 64, 65 million years. So they've been here a long time, long before us. And uh, the Adawa people have a very close connection, you know, as the Sturgeon clan is a a uh, clan to look for uh, advice and, and wisdom.
So basically what we're doing uh, is we're on our adult survey. So we have several divers that'll be floating the river looking for adult fish. Um, some fish are tagged already from this season that we've already handled. Um, others uh, that we're trying to collect are the um, new fish to this year. Um, and so we'll work those fish up. We'll take some, uh, some metrics looking at length and weight, all that kind of stuff. Um, take a fin clip for DNA analysis um, and then do some stuff for fish health as well. Um, and then inject them with a new floy tag um, and we also look for individuals um, so we can kind of track them with uh, pit tags and RFIDs and we can scan those and kind of track their growth and then um, their spawning activity. So like when they're coming in these different years, um, so that's something pretty neat that we can do. Is the idea basically to, to track how they're doing over the years and, and... Yeah, kind of monitor how these fish are doing in this uh, specific area. It's kind of the unique thing about um, the system is that they have a pretty good spawning population and they seem to be doing pretty well. Um, but then we'll also collect gametes and that kind of stuff so we can do artificial fertilization um, in the hatchery and then raise fish to be stocked out as well. If you're up in northern Michigan and you are adventurous, willing to put on some gear to go through some muck and mud and traips through the woods on what is sometimes just a deer path, you can find cool places like this on the Black River. At the hatchery on the Black River, a team of graduate students is conducting a number of different studies having to do with everything from sturgeon that spawn in different water temperatures to how sturgeon can imprint on a certain part of a riverbed and know where to go when it's time to spawn. I believe that lake sturgeon return to their natal streams to spawn. There's a lot of evidence that sturgeon return to the same rivers that they were born in. Uh, we've mostly determined this through genetics, so we'd see genetic structure, genetically structured populations in the different rivers, suggesting there's not much breeding with other distant populations. And so the idea is that similar to salmon, lake sturgeon are finding their way back to their natal streams. With salmon, there's a lot of evidence that suggests it's due to some olfactory imprinting. So when they're younger, they're imprinting by smelling some odor in the water that is specific to that stream. And then that's what brings them back to that stream when they're adults. So my project here is looking at providing evidence for that in sturgeon. So I'm raising fish in two types of water through different stages of their life. So they'll change from either groundwater to the Black River water that we use across the hatchery. Uh, the idea is that the odors that they would need to return to the stream here are in the Black River water, but they're not in the groundwater, uh, well, well water. And I'll be raising them at different stages to see if there's a time at which they might imprint on those odors. Later on this summer, once the fish have been raised enough, I'll put them in a maze and I'll put an odor at one end and an odor at the other end and see which fish go where. And so maybe a fish that were raised solely in well water will only, they either won't have a preference or will prefer the well water, while fish that were raised in the river water will prefer the river water as opposed to not preferring anything. And that would be an indicator that they are remembering this odor a bit. So that's kind of how my experiment will go later on. How long will it take you to get to where you can run your maze? Uh, I'm planning on doing that around like 60 days after they've been fertilized. Right now, it's kind of just like the first year study. If we see that there is imprinting or evidence of imprinting, we might expand it a little bit more and focus more on some of the different stages that it's occurring. But uh, uh, it's a cool project. It would really help with like best hatchery practices. Uh, right now, uh, we tend to just go by, you know, sturgeon need to be raised in their natal stream waters to like help with that imprinting. But if it's only occurring during a certain stage, that means we could raise fish in a less costly way, like a regular groundwater hatchery, and then put them in their natal stream water just during that important stage where they need to imprint. Because this hatchery here is, you know, it's right by the river, which is, is fortunate, but a lot of the other uh, streamside rearing facilities are small trailers because it's really hard to get a big facility out by the river and it's really costly. So if we could incorporate more groundwater sources for like hatchery practices it'd be uh it'd be nice to know for the future and creating more hatcheries 
I'm uh, Joe Reedy. I'm a grad student at Michigan State University in uh, King's Prisoner's Lab. Um, so what I have going out all over here is a raising surgeon at uh, two different temperatures. So on this side we have a recirculating system that keeps all the water at 10 degrees Celsius. And uh, over there is uh, 18 degrees Celsius on the other side. The temperature is really important for surgeon growth because um, it controls their metabolism. So surgeon that grow at or surgeon that are yeah, growing up in uh, warmer water uh, have a higher metabolism and uh, the yolk sac energy reserves in their eggs. Um, since they have a higher metabolism, they use that more quickly. So more of that growth is used for respiration and less is used uh, to actually get bigger. So our warm water fish actually end up being a lot smaller than our cold water fish. What I found so far is that the, the cold water fish survive higher in their um, their type of uh, environment. So the, the warm water, smaller body fish survive better in their um, environment. It's a great group that is very interested in the research that they are doing. They're happy to share the information that they've gathered and what they're hoping to gather. And it's really all about what we all can do to make sure the sturgeon continue to survive and thrive in Michigan and beyond. I'm one of the first to complain about Michigan winters, how they last too long, how they're too cold. But I gotta tell you, Northern Michigan on a beautiful spring day by a quiet river, I don't know how you beat that. It was still really cold. It's May 21st, and when I woke up this morning, it was 35 degrees out here. But now the sun is shining. It's much warmer than that. And this is just a fantastic spot along the Black River in Sheboygan County that if you get a chance to see it, you really ought to take the time and make the trip. There are many beautiful places in the world, and they all have their own sort of beauty. For me, getting away from civilization and the hustle and bustle of daily life and just being able to take a stroll along a quiet river, listening to the birds, watching for critters in the water and out, makes for a really, really peaceful time.